Welcome to the third video in a series of four looking at aspects of the economics of labour migration. In the last video, we just worked through some push and pull factors affecting migration flows. Now let's think about the impact of migration on aggregate demand and supply. Well, when we think about aggregate demand, of course, we go back to our formula that AD is C plus I plus G plus X minus M. So we're thinking about linking migration to one or more of the components of aggregate demand, particularly if there's a sustained increase in net migration into a country. And we also need to add in the possible multiplier and accelerator effects we shall talk about in this video. This is where an increase in spending in one part of the economy can have a second round effect on demand and output in other industries. Aggregate supply, and of course we can make a distinction between kind of short term effects uh, for example, what impact does migration have on wages, on unit labour costs in different industries, on spare capacity in the economy? I think crucially, we'd probably take a step back and consider in more detail the impact of migration on things like productivity, on investment by businesses and government, on enterprise and on the rate of innovation. So we'll try and say something about that in this video too. There's a huge amount to cover, so I won't go into massive detail. What about, first of all, the impact on aggregate demand? Well, one obvious point is that if there's a high level of net inward migration, for example, at the peak in the UK, the net figure was plus 350,000 in one year, then that's going to grow your population. Of course, it's, uh, it's a factor beyond the natural growth of a population to increase the size. And if a high percentage of the people coming in to a country are working, or in some form of paid work, that, in theory, is going to add to the factor incomes going around the circular flow of income and spending. And a rise in factor incomes will then drive high levels of consumer spending on goods and services, in the restaurants, in the supermarkets, and what have you. And, of course, a rise in consumer spending can also impact on other components of aggregate demand. Essentially, this slide is showing that labour migration can create additional demand for goods and services in the economy. So high consumer spending could, in theory, potentially also lead to higher investment by businesses to meet that increase in demand. Uh, higher demand and spending could generate more tax revenues for the government, which might allow them to increase their public sector spending. Uh, the demand for housing goes up, so the increase in spending in the housing sector, both to buy and to rent. Migrant entrepreneurs coming into a country can also create jobs. Startups, business startups, for example, in different cities and towns across the UK. And that would have a demand side effect as well. And potentially, if migrants set up businesses and businesses become both employers and exporters, you might see a possible lift to export capacity and uh, an, improve an improvement in the trade balance. Uh, there's also a significant link, of course, between inward migration of people coming to work and to study. So we might, well, one might see an increase in jobs, incomes and the wider consequences of an expansion of universities. Many towns and cities, of course, rely heavily on universities for the local economy. More generally, of course, the growing population increases the demand for lots of different services, from restaurants to childcare. Uh, to education, to healthcare. So there's a growing demand for services as well. Uh, I, I think overall uh, that an increase in migration does add to aggregate demand. Uh, the key issue is whether the economy can sustain a high level of migration uh, without running into other difficulties. But we'll discuss that in the fourth video. I put in the bottom right hand corner here the, the point about outflow of remittances. So many, many migrants come to the UK and other countries, live and work here, and they may choose to send a proportion of their income back to their families in the country of origin. This table is taken from the World Bank 2019 uh, data, uh, and I've lifted it from the Migration Observatory, which is based at Oxford University. Now, what I've done here is I'm showing the 20 countries receiving remittances from the UK, but I've measured it by the, the share of all remittances a country received that came from the UK. So, for example, over half of the remittance money coming into Ireland comes from the UK, 45% from Cyprus, 33% Lithuania, uh, nearly 30% in Latvia. So quite a few of those new European countries 
there's been a significant surge of people coming into the UK from them. And of course, they will, they may well send uh, some, some money home. Indeed, in all of these cases, at least 10% of the remittance income a country receives comes from the UK. Here's a quiz question for you. Uh, what links these companies, Apple, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Uber, Airbnb, Tesla, 3M and PayPal? What do you think links these three companies? Well, you might, you might want to press the pause button and do a bit of research, but uh, have a go. Well, the answer is that uh, all of these countries, uh, companies are tech companies companies founded by first and second generation immigrants into the United States. And I think it's an interesting example of the potential impact of migration on aggregate supply. Now, aggregate supply, of course, thinks about the supply side capacity and the supply side capability of a country. Short term and long term aggregate supply. What, what impact could migration have there? Well, firstly, of course, it may well lead to an expansion in the active labour force effectively increasing the country's productive potential, increasing the stock of labour, which would cause the production possibility curve to shift outwards. So the labour force goes up, especially perhaps in countries experiencing an ageing population uh, and potential negative natural population growth. Uh, migrants coming in with skills and qualifications and talents may increase the stock of human capital available to a country, not just the number of people, not just the quantity but also the quality of labour. And in many cases, migrant workers can increase the flexibility of the labour market, in particular by helping to relieve shortages of labour in key areas. Work and study are the main, most common reasons for moving to the UK. It's about 70-75% of long-term immigration. Uh, and many people come to work in shortage occupations, including, for example, in healthcare and social care. And on the aggregate supply side, migration can help reduce uh, the age dependency ratio, which is clearly a long term threat to growth and public finances. I've added two more points and put them in, in, in question mark in different colours. There's a debate over the extent to which migration can also lead to a rise in business startups, particularly if a country is able to attract people who are entrepreneurial in nature. It could be the case, you know, your STEM graduates, your software engineers, your people who've got really interesting ideas to start up businesses, that can have an aggregate supply effect. And so too, uh, aggregate supply in the long term can go up if the, the average quality of migrants is high, both in terms of age and experience and uh, qualifications and talents, it can sometimes lift labour productivity and that can have an impact on per capita incomes. So there we go, some thoughts on the impact of migration on both the demand and also the supply side of the economy. Now in the fourth and final video, we're going to do a kind of evaluation exercise, evaluate the case for and against an increase in net migration in terms of a country's economic performance.